Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Agnes and I'm one of the curators of the Museum of the Anthropocene, uh, Virtualne Museum Anthropocenu, uh, where we have a fantastic exhibition at the minute, Niezaspokojony uh, Wood Endless Hunger. And today I have a fabulous guest, Pierre Leichner, one of the artists that presents um, his works uh, at our exhibition. And I just wanted to say a few words about uh, Pierre. Uh, Pierre was always, um, well, he was fascinated by science at first. Uh, he became a psychiatrist, uh, but after all, he decided that he preferred uh, to be an artist and to express himself as an artist. Uh, so since about 10 years, uh, he's been creating his artworks and they are just so fascinating. Uh, we have two of his um, works at our exhibition. Every Venus Tells a Story and Worm at Artwork, Footprint Series 1. And uh, he's a fantastic and uh, interdisciplinary um, artist and a researcher. And he also um, works on, on tracts that include uh, the social and political focus, but also the personal inquiry. So um, I guess without the further ado, uh, we would like Pierre to talk a little bit about his work and inspirations. So, ah, yes, yeah, sorry, just to um, uh, mention something I forgot. If you have any questions, anybody who's watching us, uh, please write in the chat and then I will ask Pierre at the, at the end of our conversation. So please, Pierre, uh, explain a little bit about your fantastic works. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. I mean, first, let me really thank the organization for the museum and this really uh, wonderful opportunity and, 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 one of, and a, sadly, but a great theme, really, uh, to uh, have an exposition on. Um, so first, before I, uh, I start into talk, talking a bit about my work, I want to first acknowledge that uh, I am very fortunate and privileged to live on, uh, in North Vancouver, on the unceded territory of the Squamish nation. Uh, I think this is something that's happening all over the world, obviously, at this point, this realization of the uh, tragic uh, and harm that uh, the process of colonization uh, carried out on, on indigenous uh, uh, culture around the world. And I think the important connection here is that I think it's probably fair to say that around the world, indigenous cultures uh, have a closer relationship to their environment and a closer relationship uh, to the uh, organisms that live on it, a more better, more respect. And that's something that we, we lost in Western civilization and that we're suffering the effects of uh, uh, nowadays. So I think uh, that's uh, something to mention and, and, and awareness. So, briefly, I want to start by giving you a bit of background to the two works that are on show. I'll give you a bit of blah, blah, blah on the other ones that I've done before as they relate to this theme. Why am I interested in this theme? And then, of course, it'd be great to answer any questions or show you any other pieces of work that you might want to look at. So, right. the story is going to start with uh, this apple. So, this is, it looks like a beautiful apple, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. see them at the grocery store all the time. Perfect. There is no blemish, nothing on it. And then you got a number on the back. You got a little number here. It's a four-digit yeah. number. And so, what this apple tell? What the story behind this apple is that this apple was most likely uh, raised in a major orchard, large orchard, using insecticides, pesticides, fungicides, you name it. And it was raised on soil that is relatively depleted, uh, where chemicals had to be put. And that's what this number tells you. So, why is that of relevance? Well. Uh, the issue around soil fertility is an issue I became aware of uh, a few years back. Uh, and the story there is all these chemicals we use in our gardens and everything obviously eventually fall on the ground. They go into the ground and mm -hmm. no surprise, they harm the animal, the organisms in the ground themselves, in particular earthworms. And earthworms are, there's a long history of knowing that they are, they account for soil fertility by digesting the things that go in the soil and also by aerating it, creating tunnels and so on. So the more pesticides you put on, the less your soil is fertile, the more you have to give chemicals, 
uh, fertilizers and, and the vicious cycle. So uh, my thought was, okay, how do I show this? How do I express this to an audience that is very happy buying these apples and other perfect looking uh, vegetables and fruits? How do I get this message across? I have a bit of uh, uh, interest, I had interest in bio art, which is this connection between working with plant living organisms and art, making art in between ethically so that no one is harmed during the process. Uh, and so I said, okay, how can I do this? And this is where the idea came up for the series of paintings that are the worm art uh, projects. So I'm going to show you, if, if technology helps us in this case, I'm going to show you a little clip of uh, the worm art project. So we're going to go to sharing the screen. Okay. And hopefully, again, we're going to go here. Aha. So far, so good. Can you see that? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So basically, what I do in this project is I put, I paint on a piece of paper or canvas. Uh, signs or uh, images uh, that are in non-toxic paint, but mm -hmm. in the paint I put insecticide or fungicide or those chemicals that are harmful to, to worms. And then I put worms on the, on the paper. Uh, and you can see, if you watch carefully, you'll see very quickly that these are compost, oh, okay, these are compost worms. They do not like they go to that place where the paint is and they move away yeah. immediately because their skin immediately senses that they, this is not, I don't like this chemical. So they, you can see all over the place how this happens. Uh, this is incredible, Pierre. <laughs> yeah. And so now you say, well, the, and they, the worms themselves are in uh, uh, non-toxic. So very important. They're not harmed. This is food dye. Yeah. So they're not toxic, they don't mind the dye, but wherever they move, they leave a trace, right? And that's kind of yeah. creates an abstract pattern. Now, the way that this work goes, once they've done that, I take them off and I put them back into the compost pile. So they're quite unharmed and uh, happy of having done the work. This piece of work, for example, is they took a number of, of uh, more days to do. For example, this is a close up of how you see again, that worm just goes, Whoop, I don't like that. And I move away, <laughs> right? And uh, yeah. so it's pretty evident. And by the end of the, uh, uh, I use, I may go back with different colors and if this is where the artistic component comes in, I may put different colors on the, uh, and, and we could kind of get the image. So that at the end of the day, after a few days of work, uh, I have something like this at the end. Uh, so this is a, the final piece of work that uh, may be uh, visible then. So this is basically uh, a series of work, uh, which are called, uh, uh, sorry, okay, I have to kind of get out of the screen. So how do I, I go back to StreamYard? Okay, so this is a series of work that uh, I have, I have about 20 of these pieces, and I kind of grow on and I learn and I've, as I go along uh, this, uh, with this series of, so it's related to this issue. Okay, so the next, Yes. Could I just ask, uh, because sure. it's very related to that, do you use uh, particular colors? I mean, do you have particular colors in mind or is just the abstract or do you have an idea for the colors? Actually? Yes. So, I mean, I consult with my worms and so on and we think it out. We do think it out. We do plan, okay. uh, depending on the theme. So you'll see themes that are more uh, nat nature oriented. So there's more the greens and the blues. And then there are things that are more confrontational, like the one I just showed you, where you're going to see more yellow, orange, mm. or more of the colors that uh, kind of make you think about what's going on here that, uh, that is more uh, um, anger or there's more emotion. Yeah. In it. So, yes, obviously, yes, I do plan. And these, uh, fortunately, there are a range of non-toxic dyes that are available for that. So they can make beautiful cakes with them, but you can also have worms make paintings with them. So uh, coming back now to um, going on to the next piece of work, which are the Venus, every Venus tells a story. How does that, uh, I was very fortunate a number of years ago to go to Vienna in the anthropo uh, anthropology or the natural museum. And I actually saw the Venus. Now, Venus is a, about 11 centimeter high, yeah. uh, little figurine, a fertility goddess, we think. Uh, and I really fell in love with that little figurine. 
And it's come to represent in some ways for us, the mother earth or a representation of, uh, of uh, the, the planet and the earth. So I, I came back, I then mold, I, had, I bought a little replica and then I molded, made molds of it. And I started to think about how can I make molds that gonna way of expressing through this mold, through this metaphor in a way, the issues that we're talking about, this overconsumption. So uh, let me just show you then, share the screen. Again, this is a, takes a couple clicks to do, but hopefully this will work. Yeah, it's quite quick. I have it yeah. already. So it's, you see, I made about like, really we're talking about wow. 50 or more of those figures. Like this one, for example, has a phone. You can see the, the phone pad in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the iPhone is in there uh, as well as this one. Uh, other ones have com pieces of computer, computer chips in them. Uh, computer, uh, as we know, the troubles of what we do with all the materials we throw away from computers are, are all included and coming out of the, these little figurines. Uh, and I, you know, this, this figurine has soldiers in it, for example, little soldiers. Okay. And here's a piece of work that is in the museum right now. And in this piece, I was able to uh, f make the mold hollow. So these are hollow figurines, which I could then fill in with uh, different colors of, of, uh, of water and put a plastic straw, which we know is a problem, and a little, mm -hmm. make it look like a cocktail. So the illusion here is that we are uh, exploiting, we are sucking the life out of the planet just for our own pleasure. You know, it's like, it's a cool mm -hmm. life. The planet is a little cocktail for us to utilize. And uh, uh, there are, I have other figurines which kind of are on the theme of uh, uh, exploitation, which are again, uh, Chem, uh, like obviously oil and copper and silver and so on. And if we look a little further down, also these are open pit mines, so to speak, that are in a way that are what we're doing to the planet. So, mm -hmm. so this is, uh, uh, I will close this one and I will go back to StreamYard. So this is a, a theory and here are, if you want to see a bit what they look like, these are my little, uh, these are the Venuses I have. I also have videos on, uh, related to this theme on my website. So, okay, so these are the two pieces of work that, uh, that are uh, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the show. So briefly, just going backwards a bit as to why, uh, how I became interested in the issue of hunger or food production and food consumption and, and these issues. Well, I am, um, my parents are Hungarian and we were refugees. They emigrated to, uh, to France. And so that's where I got my uh, early upbringing. And so as you can, Hungary, Hungarians and French, you can understand why I'm interested in food, so to speak. I mean, we were cultural. <laughs> so obviously I became uh, interested in early on. And uh, when I retrained as an artist, I also kind of reacted to the art that is in galleries and you know white cubes and so on. And so I started to work around things that are around me rather than going making things. I was interested in what surrounds me. So one of my feasts, my, my first piece uh, of work uh, was called Food Wars. And essentially I started by just taking images of the meals I was making and including into the meals some of the images, some of the issues that I thought would be there. So let's see if I can again share a couple of my food wars. Oh, no, Chrome tab, okay. Hopefully this will be right, okay. So, um, so these are simply, you know, after a meal, I would just put little soldiers into these images and mm. I would create a soundtrack that was kind of aggressive, obviously, but it was about food making, it was food production while I'm cooking them. And these are some of the images of of the series, so you can see more or less what I was eating over a period of a few weeks. So these are all the meals that I prepared, that we prepared, and they all kind of relate to issues around governmental control, inclusion, sometimes oppression uh, mm -hmm. in the process of, uh, of different foods. And again, uh, you know, essentially, uh, this balance how food can be the territory of of uh, battles and, and so on. Mm. 
So this was one of my first uh, kind of pieces around uh, looking at food and, and, and uh, the issues around food production. The next piece, actually, can you see that? Uh, not yet. Okay, so let me just go back to uh, StreamYard. So the next piece, as I was in school, I was clued into the issue, the harm of colonialism, colonialism. It's something that even though I was a medical student and for many, many years, never during my training was there ever an issue around. It wasn't brought up. That wasn't a, it wasn't a thing. Indigenous cultures were suffering, suicide, yes, mm -hmm. alcoholism, yes, but because, not a word. But when I went to art school, obviously, I become much more aware of the issues of colonialism. So one of the next, one of the next pieces I did was called Pairings. And uh, I'm going to share this one. Uh, and it was basically when I learned, obviously, that. Uh, so you got this one. And I like this piece, although it has really not been shown <laughs> much. But basically, if you can see that. Yes. Yes. So I, I collected a whole bunch of little furniture, but also mostly coffee tables. Because okay. coffee tables are a new creation. I mean, they're not there. They weren't there 300 years ago. They came about when uh, we started to colonize, when we used to get coffee and tea. And they became a part of the furniture to have, uh, you know, tea time and coffee time. And uh, so I collected these uh, used coffee tables, but I put on them uh, the pictures of skin, different colors of skin, uh, and uh, enlarged. So kind of abstract. You couldn't at first see them. And then but what kind of skin? Skin, what yeah. What kind of skin? Well, they, I mean, these are photographs. Yeah. So it's it's on uh, on a, on a pliable kind of a background, but basically, uh, let me see if you can see. Well, if you could make it larger, if you could make the screen larger. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There we go. So uh, maybe reduce the sound so we can hear you. Yeah. 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 So essentially, what you see, I mean, these are uh, um, tables, and then this kind of large picture of of skin. Uh, an abstraction and on it I would put uh, egg, the teas and coffees and the exotic mm. fruits that we still do I mean we still go out to the colonies or ex colonies to get these and bring them in and often, of course we exploit the people there in the production of this food so in this uh, exhibition the uh, people were invited to partake as well. It wasn't just to come and see, but if you want to taste the tea or the fruit and so on, I invited people because I like to work across senses. I like to have auditory, taste if I can work it in, visual, all working together to make the mm -hmm. point about what the, the issue is and kind of immerse the, uh, the ginger, to immerse the person into, into the piece. So this was pairings. And from there, I briefly went uh, to Okay, let me just uh, go back to my stream. I, would, I went back to, from this preoccupation with food, well, before, I'll, I'll say how things are connected. Being French, I don't know if you know this. This is a poire William. Ah, oui. <laughs> and there's a pear in it, in the bottle. So you said, you, so in France, I, I, you know, I knew about poire William. So how do you get the pear in there, right? Mm. So obviously, there's a trick. You gotta get the pear in while it's small, and then you let it grow in there, which is quite a mm. feat, if you ask me. However, they do it. So I kind of knew about this thing about getting things into growing into objects. And I went into starting to do a series of biological gardens. So I work in, in I grew vegetable gardens, and uh, I uh, I started to uh, include within those gardens. Uh, the issues that we confront, pollution, plastics, and mm. so on. And, uh, and uh, okay. And as you can see here, for example, this is a garden that I set up a few years ago. And you see some of the objects, the refuse, the things we throw out, and I made things grow in them. I also designed an on and off button here and different type of posts about buy fresh, buy local. And I also started to capture, in other words, these vegetables into some of the plastic 
that we find everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like you see a tomato growing in a syringe and, yeah. and so on. So this kind of interface between nature overcoming, this is says resistance is not futile. So having kind of a uh, direct uh, view of what uh, plastic and like, pollution is doing to vegetables. So I was growing this, uh, this garden and one day I was just there and this fellow comes along and he says, uh, hello, this is I'm just saying, he says, uh, uh, I'm Dr. Legu. Uh <laughs> And you know, I think, uh, uh, let me see, let me just close this one. I think Dr. Legume is, is there. So just give me one. Okay. Dr. Okay, I'm coming back. I will be right there. Just uh, Dr. Legume, please, please come here. Let me go. Shortly, we'll see Dr. Legume. Bonjour. Oh, bonjour. <laughs> bonjour. Bonjour, Agnès. Bonjour, Salut. Dr. Legume. <laughs> oui, bonjour. Bonjour. Salut. Uh, so, hello. Uh, hello. Yes, yes. So, yes, I met Pierre in the garden and I said, how can I help? I am a plastic surgeon. So, how can I help this? And uh, he said, well, I don't know. Maybe you can f wait to help these vegetables. Horrible story that mm. you have in plastic. Can you imagine plastic and vegetables? Incredible. So, with my very unique, I'm the only plastic surgeon in the world for vegetables and fruits, right? And we know how plastic gets in the body and they, all that stuff. So here is a little clip of the very incredible surgeries. And you can see them on my YouTube channel, Dr. Legu. Yes. Uh, and I will share the screen here. Uh, and you see there are just a little clip of um, what Dr. Legu can do. And this is not it. Okay. Uh, okay. That's so, not. No, that's not the one. So let me just see whether I click on here. Ah, oh, Dr. Legume. Uh, maybe I'll go back to this one. Yes. You see that? Are you seeing Dr. Legume? Yes. Okay. Yes. So here is Dr. Legume. Very brief clip. Oh, Pierre, it's, it's actually a picture only. Sorry. It's okay. not video. No? No, that's not it. No. <laughs> okay, let's let's just Okay, let's just go back to StreamYard and let's share the screen. Uh, un moment, s'il vous plaît. J'arrive. Oui. Il y a toujours des problèmes, hein? on peut pas. On peut oh, that's technology, Pierre. Mais oui, 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 oui. Excusez-moi, ah. Dr. Legume. Un pas en avant, un pas en arrière. C'est toujours comme ça. Bon, alors... Comme euh, ça, toujours. Vous voyez ça maintenant? You see that? Dr. Uh, oui, but that's la tomatoes to go, yes. yes. Voilà, voilà, voilà. Here we go. Bonjour and hello to you and to me too. This is Dr. Legumes. Today, we have an incredible amount of clients. I am going to be working late into the night. trying to save as many as I can. First, I am going to show you a very sad story of what happens if you do not operate fast enough. A container for ketchup and a tomato caught in it. It makes no sense where this world is coming to. Voilà. Très bien. This family is now happily reunited. Mother, father, uncle and the twins. So, Bravo. I've never seen before. You know, it cannot but be natural for tomatoes to fall into them. So this is a tomato in the syringe. Very nice. A beautiful shot. Look at this happy family again. And isn't this beautiful? We cannot be happier than this. Yeah. So, uh, So a whole series of these, it's magnifique, and I try my best to save these. Oui. So I don't think Pierre wants me to talk much more, but I encourage you to go there. I do other kind of, I also do recipes on taste. Okay. What is the taste of absence? How do you make something that tastes like an absence? Mm. Or how do you make something that tastes like uh, um, acceptance? 
And also how to make a ratatouille so that the vegetables don't suffer. Because we never think of the vegetables. No. And so you won't have a happy zucchini because, because if the zucchini is happy, it will taste much better. So this is okay. a recipe for the perfect ratatouille. I'll leave you here and I come right away back. So Merci, you. Dr. Legume. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're we are waiting for Pierre. Yo, I'm here. I'm here. Hello, Pierre. Hello, we Pierre. met Dr. Legume. He was really interesting and Thank he you. showed us very interesting clips of right. very, very, you know, intricate surgeries on vegetables. So, yes. yeah. So I'm going to be finishing very shortly. And I just want to tell you, uh, it's uh, the other thing I do work with is, of course, is, is uh, I do work through using animal, bio arts or animals and also vegetables. So just a couple of last examples on this before yeah. we open it up. Um, chrome. Uh, I think this one. So this is some of the work that is really um, pertinent. Can you see that? Yes, but if you could reduce the sound, that would be great. OK. So we can hear your explanation. So yeah, so essentially, this is uh, <laughs> working with animals, uh, uh, mostly uh, dogs and birds. Uh, I'm able to kind of uh, have fun and mm -hmm. uh, have uh, you know little messages. Up. So I have about fifty or more of these kind of works that uh, kind of address this theme uh, in a way that might have the viewer kind of intrigued and. Uh, uh, find it kind of different uh, and, and see a message that they may not necessarily see. Mm. So here, essentially, this, this uh, seagull is working hard to share with us the message uh, that uh, the Anthropocene uh, is for the birds. So about that, and there's a whole range of messages around. And if I may ask, how long does it take to film uh, something like this, the work with a bird or multiple birds, as I've seen? Yeah, here are the dogs, but I'll stop right here. Or dogs, yes. Yeah. Well, it depends on the animal, obviously, <laughs> and the mood they're in and how hungry they are. <laughs> so uh, some animals are very fast, and other animals you have to go back and back and kind of finish it and edit it. So uh, okay. it's, it's everything from an hour to two, you can probably film that segment, um, depending on, on, on the day. Um, the worms take longer, usually it takes uh, yeah. hours. So that uh, essentially is a whole host of, of, of uh, bird projects I have that uh, are around that. And the final thing is that I do have a socially engaged practice uh, in which I go out and work with the community to get these themes out there, this connection with nature and this, uh, this more recent respect and mindfulness about what we do. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop now to give enough time, but I have those on other uh, uh, sites that people want to see um, about setting up interaction and community engaged art projects uh, with children and with adults where they can make work, paint or cut out or do things that are related to to ask questions about you know food and and pollution and and, and production um so i think uh, that's and i'm still obviously preoccupied with this uh, this these things mm. um, as they pertain uh, to my daily life um so that's a bit of a quick overview of some of the things that i do i obviously work in a multiple I like to be multidisciplinary. I like when yes. research comes, I like to look at things from different points of view. And I also believe in uh, having the message out in an accessible way. So every, any, anybody mm. can kind of reach into it somehow and also different senses. So whether it's just visual, then I'll try to see how does it sound? If I can, how does it taste and how does it feel? So that when people go to the work, they kind of engage across multiple senses. Yes, of course. I mean, multi-sensory experience is really great and really yeah. can, uh, I guess, um, 
get the the right uh, the right uh, answer or the right um, uh, effect on the viewer because the more you experience something or the artwork the more you can actually give it back but also absorb and then exactly. so actually uh, I would like to ask you what is your intention with all these artworks I mean I know you are trying to help the environment you have social and political um, agendas on, on your mind. But the intention, is it just, uh, I mean, do you have anything else to add on the intention itself? Do you just want to change the world? Do you want it to be better? Or do you want to educate more younger viewers? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously art, I firmly believe is essential to the well-being of individuals and community. All right, so that's the basic starting thing. Uh, and to the degree that art has lost its place uh, relative to science, relatively to entertainment, quick entertainment, anyway, to endless hunger, if you want, it's because art is a slower process to enjoy. Uh, in that sense, I am in trying to kind of correct the balance again, to kind of bring back science and art together in a way, uh, and, and to slow the process of people uh, that unfortunately our society, Western society is engaged in you know, more and more and faster and faster. So in there, there is that kind of uh, realization that uh, that's one of my uh, beliefs and uh, one of my goals. Um, now in terms of uh, the work and how, what are the themes that I choose, I mean, those are obviously personal issues. I do personally believe that the, kind, the type of work mm. I'm interested in, I think all art is valuable, but I, I'm obviously interested in, in um, art uh, that explores, art that teaches, art that educates, art that, that creates questions, not in a didactic way, in a curiosity way, um, to a wider audience. Uh, I think that's, for me, part of the response responsibility of an artist if they choose to do that that kind of practice so yeah. um so i see art as a potential way of of sharing knowledge in an embodied way right it's not just being hearing it and mm -hmm. there it's also feeling it because that's really when you understand something so that's why i would use something like uh, i would think about you know the worms the worms are mostly visual at this point uh, but they shed a right away a guttural feeling. I mean, uh, people usually, when they see this, the, the videos, they go, mm -hmm. so it creates a kind of a gut reaction um, and it makes people then uh, connect them and hopefully makes them connect and become aware of, of the, eventually the issues that are there. And uh, I've done it through that. Uh, I use humor as well. I mean, that's my personality. Uh, I believe in that humor is a way again to get into some of these issues mm. without having people go, well, I've heard this before, I know the word is polluted, and I know that uh, we're insecticized and not good, but it's another, what do you do about it? So it, it's another way to kind of introduce these topics uh, in a way that somebody is going, oh, oh, isn't that nice? And then, <laughs> well, it isn't yeah. that. So I do use humor uh, a fair amount as well. Uh, what else? Um, I think that's very admirable of you and also very uh, interesting and engaging because as you mentioned, I mean, if you use humor for something, then obviously something becomes uh, a bit co a bit different to what right. we are used to and then we can react in a more positive and more engaging way. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yes, uh, there is also a question about Venus. So. Uh, can you tell us more about your Venuses? And I actually have the question because you mentioned that you were fascinated by that Venus when you visited the museum in Austria. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to know, was, that, was there anything um, else or just because uh, this, uh, this little figurine is a symbol of maybe Mother Earth or uh, some kind of goddess from the ancient times, but was there anything else uh, that attracted you? To, to that Venus? Well, I mean, I have to uh, acknowledge some of my previous career. Uh, I, for many, many years, worked in the field of eating disorders and anorexia and bulimia. And so uh, 
these figurines obviously are images of, and again, I'm just imagining, speculating, we don't know for sure, but the images of beauty and what uh, our ancestors used to value or used to spend, and, and also the, the uh, one way that one could see also perhaps the power or the energy of mat matriarchal uh, 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 civilizations. But so I was attracted to these figurines because they obviously confront some of the damaging um, images and beliefs that uh, our society still struggles with today about body image issues. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, you know, this, okay. so that's one of the other things that uh, drew me to the to this figurine in particular. Yes, and I wanted to ask because I've seen your video uh, of the Venus dispersing, I mean, coming, so it's like a uh, birth of a Venus, like in yeah. mythology, from yeah. foam, yeah. and then is dispersing again. Could you just explain a little bit about this? Why did you choose this type of, so she's born and then she disappears. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What's behind that story? Well, this is a connection to a bit of my other interest in more cosmology and uh, um, physics and that kind of thing. So I have a kind of science interest in that. And so some of my work right now, if you go on my website, is also about um, black holes and uh, mm -hmm. gravitational waves. And I do, and I transform these ideas into paintings on doors and so on. So I do that kind of work. So how does that relate to that? Well, uh, the birth of the universe. Well. Who knows, right? But, however, uh, there are beliefs that we come from really uh, this kind of uh, the Big Bang. And, and, and then the thing, out of that, uh, things start to organize, start to clump. They start to come together. And uh, galaxies and planets and stars out of this Big Bang, this wave of energy, eventually over uh, years, things start to reform, to clump. So we have, from this organization, we have organization happening mm -hmm. uh, in a way, an energy uh, getting together. So we have uh, the birth of planets, Earth, and so on. So the Venus kind of is formed from this. But the theory as well, it goes that theoretically at some point, that's all going to tip over and it's actually going back to, it's going to be reversed to this uh, uh, point of total and entropy where there's no organization again and everything goes back to this. not zero, but Pretty close, so it then fall and go and disappears again. So you see the Venus in a way being formed, and then you also see the Venus going back into a state of uh, high entropy. From no yeah. entropy. I understand. Yeah, now it makes makes more sense. Of course, I mean it was mesmerizing to watch it anyhow because it reminded me also. Uh, about the Little Mermaid, but not the Disney version, but yeah. the real story. She also disperses into the foam, so it's birth of one Venus and then disappearance of of another creature. But yes, as you said, I mean, this whole uh, big, ba big, ba big bang <laughs> sorry, happened, yeah. and then uh, things were created and also they will disappear at some point. So yes, of course. I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, we live in such times, uh, how does the Anthropocene affect you as a person, not just an artist, but as a person? Is this, uh, does this affect has um, the power that you think, okay, as a person I'm affected, so I'm gonna create artwork immediately, or do you, do you notice certain things and then slowly but surely you, you comment on that artistically? Um. Hmm. Well, I mean, <clears throat> okay, the Anthropocene as a concept, as a, as a uh, period and so on, really came to people's attention 15, 20 years ago. It started to become a, a, something that people wrote about, and became, I, so I say I became more aware of it as, as actually this is, hey, this is a period, um, maybe even early, a bit earlier, but it's not, it's a relatively recent thought that uh, yeah. went through a stage that's dominated by the changes created by humans. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, to some degree, I, I would think that even before that, I was kind of aware of the damages and the effects of, uh, of uh, uh, our, our, our uh, human invasion uh, has and how we're uh, uh, being neglectful and disrespectful to our environment. Uh, I think that's something I 
uh, traveling around the parts of the world, I became much more aware of it. Um, in, in North America, you we we hide the damages much more than some other countries, and uh, where you immediately see uh, damages to people and to the environment. So I became much more aware of that many years ago, and um, I suppose um, part of my work is about finding a voice through art to express that, uh, because there is at least more, there is somewhat less oppression or suppression of artists in this country anyway, than there may be in other countries, but there's more opportunity for artists to say, well, I don't like this, or you know, and uh, this is how I express it. Uh, and um, uh, so um, that is probably what drew me to that. And I actually, that's why I left psychiatry in a way, because I felt that that become too uh, suppressive or oppressive for me. So, so this is a new way of, of expressing things. So it's kind of a back and forth thing. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes, yeah. yes, it does. And would you change anything now that you are actually doing what you thought this is what you wanted to do? Would you change anything? Or you just, uh, you are happy doing, I mean, incredible work uh, that we saw. Uh, how, how does this make you feel? Well, I mean, I'll be honest. As an artist, uh, I'm glad when I get to do the work. Uh, I struggle with finding the time to do the work Mm -hmm. because of all the uh, submissions, applications, and all the stuff. And, uh, and getting the thing out takes a lot of time. Uh, I also have a project uh, that falls more on a socially engaged uh, administrative part, creating, organizing festivals for uh, underrepresented artists, marginalized artists. And that is a, a slug. That is a hard. Uh, it's not easy to find the funds. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not easy not to feel some reaction towards an art market that can put out a piece of work for a million dollars or two million dollars just because it's an investment not that because it's a particularly wonderful piece of work not because there's not hundreds of thousands of other artists who are capable of doing better or same work but we'll get if they're lucky a hundred dollars for it and you know that kind of inequity it just drives mm -hmm. me crazy so yeah so i still carry a bit of that it's not a great there's a lot of work to be done within the art world to um, develop this inclusion. I mean, people talk inclusion, diversity, and equity. Well, the art world has got a lot of work, work to do to become more inclusive and to be more equitable. And so, Definitely. That, so that's uh, another part of my life, which I must share is, is more uh, frustrating. Uh, yeah. So I'm, yeah, so doing the work is the best part. Uh, getting it shown, if it gets shown, is also enjoyable. Uh, but uh, a lot of the other stuff, I could, live, you know, it's tough. It's it's emotionally again uh, not easy. Yes, I guess all the disciplines have uh, carry some disadvantages and advantages. Sure. But yeah, I know. I mean, art world is especially now it's a bit um, of a strange um, environment, and definitely something should be done to um, accommodate artists like you. And you know what you do is incredible, and also that you help others. I mean, mm -hmm. and and the fact that uh, you know you use multisensory um, art and and uh, try to engage the the audience, but also intrigue them because obviously Dr. Legume is very intriguing. Worms are very intriguing. I mean, worms artwork. You know, you, you hear that and you think, what? Hold on a sec, what is that? <laughs> so, right. yeah, that you you uh, get to know the story behind it and it's so fascinating. I mean, how they, uh, may, may we just say again that no worms were harmed in the video. Yes, so, and yes. They, aren't they go back to the compost pile, <laughs> come from the compost pile, and it's a well <laughs> compost pile, and they go back. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, they're okay with it. I don't, you know, they <laughs> went back in. They don't complain. Uh, maybe I'll get a grievance one day. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's another preoccupation is to be respectful towards the environment. And, and I wouldn't dream of doing something that would be directly harmful to any organism that I know. I work with plants, roots. I do sculptures with roots. That's another aspect of my work uh, that, um, again, it's that connection between nature and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and humans. Um, yeah, so it, it is. Uh, 
ongoing work uh, and, um, and by being kind of open to the world around then issues come up or opportunities come up and they come in my backyard and I will you know go from there um, and it's also about doing combining things I like to do anyway. mm. that's another thing that's the obvious thing is you know I'm not gonna um, focus on and making things or doing things that I'm not uh, interested that I don't have an internal interest or knowledge about and I think that's why your works are so interesting and nice because you actually put your heart into it and this is what you love and this is what you want to yeah make so that's that's fantastic mm -hmm. and uh, one more um, question about the consumerism so we talked about consumerism and uh, mm -hmm. for example in Venus and also the consumerism I guess the the parts that you put in her the computer mm -hmm. parts or other parts also uh, the yeah. worms or the apple the consumerism so um, do you think is there something apart from you know artistic uh, the the uh, sorry the um, you um, uh, making art that actually uh, takes the viewer and uh, introduces this kind of topic? Do you think uh, something more could be done? Do you think we can start from small changes because you know we are not all artists, so some of us we can't really you know express that. How can we actually make a difference in terms of consumers consume, consuming too much and um, yeah, yeah, being harmful to the environment? Yes, well, that's a very, you know, that's a very good question and an important one. And uh, uh, I mean, the simple question is the simple answer. I mean, it's simple, but it's very difficult to uh, to put in place. Is yeah, I think I th I think that we're getting closer to the point. Uh, um, on the, on the global scale where uh, it's uh, m most humans are going to be aware that there's a problem at some point and, you know whether you're in any part of the world we're getting closer to that realization and with that realization then it becomes uh, an individual responsibility to do the right thing and to start uh, cutting back you ask the question before you go out and get your new iphone or your new uh, you go to the supermarket and go for the biggest and uh, Apple, uh, or you, you know, you, you have a choice sometimes in apples. You can look at the numbers. If it's a five digit number, it's probably organic. But you can start making those decisions uh, if you're informed uh, in your own personal life. So that's where it has to start uh, because that's what's eventually is going to make the difference on the market and so on. Because the, hoping that the big markets and the corporations now are going to make the switch, that hasn't, they will respond mm. to the pressure, but they themselves are very slow. To actually make the change because there's a whole investment and all the stakeholder business that goes in there. Um, I, I think uh, that's where it has to start. Um, uh, it's a, it's got, it's a difficult, it's a really difficult thing to swing and change because uh, the whole thing about um, the this endless kind of wanting and needing more and wanting more consumer and more buying more and so on without really thinking over the effects is is really a, obviously a very uh, um, something that started centuries ago uh, and its roots are also in the biology of humans so I think there's mm -hmm. a I mean we it's an evolutionary thing that makes us want to get more and do more uh, whether it's a genetic uh, kind of territorial urge whether it's a genetic, get your genes out there, protect your territory, gather more so that your your group gets more of something than the next door person or the next group, so you get a better chance to survive. It has that kind of background as well. Um, uh, and so it's 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 a, it's a multi-level kind of complex issue. So there's a need to kind of I think engage in it and and resist it because it can change. But we got to resist it at uh, not only at the thinking level, we have to each of us resist it at the gut level as well, because most of us are going to be drawn to that beautiful apple. I mean, we're going to be drawn to that. So it's a res something we have to can that beautiful new car, mm -hmm. beautiful new TV, a beautiful new thing. We're going to be drawn into it. So there's kind of a need to kind of, you know, kind of pull back and we realize that uh, in the long run, that's not the way we have to go and to really kind of speak up about it so 
it's a it's a number and i i think it's i mean as people have said otherwise you know it's it's a battle for our survival i don't mm. think we don't do it our children and our children's children and so on and whoever are, are going to have a very different world and the other thing just before i go too long is uh i mean science has been part of the problem part of the solution part of the problem because science has been uh you know we we bought into science as this kind of magical mythical i fix we fix science will fix everything so yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, we got pollution. We'll figure out a way to make the sea better. Uh, we will figure out something. Now, in the meanwhile, a lot of people suffer, animals die. Well, you know, we'll fix it. Uh, and if then we don't fix it, we'll go to Mars. Yeah. We'll just uh, go send you know, the next <laughs> to Mars, and that's we'll fix it there. So yeah, it's not that easy, is it? <laughs> well, it's also a very dangerous frame of mind because you're gonna screw up Mars just as much as you screw the Earth. I mean, if you don't change your mindset about how you're doing things. Mm. It's just going to keep on going. It's going to be a bad story again. So yeah, um, science that way has kind of created this false uh, expectation, this kind of and willful blindness where people can look the other way. You know, it'll, it'll get solved later. Not maybe, maybe in 20 years, we won't have the damages. We'll have electricity everywhere. Well, meanwhile, mm. you know, people are dying, animals are dying, and so on. So um, science has been part of the issue as well by not saying, okay, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, not being upfront and saying there are limits to what we can do. Or scientists, well, science, some scientists, I would say, have. Spoken. But science also helps. So, yes, as you said, I mean, it's double edged sword. So, yes, oh. we, we have to be careful. But definitely, I, I think that uh, all these issues that you raised, uh, that they should be actually discussed yeah. seriously and taken seriously. But that's, yeah. that's what we are trying to do and you are trying to yeah. do. Exactly. And yes, I mean, if we work together, maybe, maybe there will be something uh, well, I, done I, I, at I some be, point. Yeah, every bit. I mean, you know, I believe in that kind of, uh, I don't know who said it, you know, every grain of sand eventually becomes a beach. So, uh, you know, every step we do, everything that we do, I think has uh, an impact uh, you know, down the line. And it's hard to measure, but, but what is the choice, right? There is no yeah, real. I mean, we, gotta do we can do. Yeah, we can do only what we can do. I mean, it starts from small steps, and then, as you said, it becomes a bit. So, uh, thank you, Pierre. I think uh, this was a fascinating presentation and fascinating uh, talk with you. I mean, I was very excited because. Your work is phenomenal. Uh, I uh, I urge everyone. I put in chat uh, to visit Dr. Legume because he's really interesting, mm -hmm. and also Legume, and also uh, obviously your website and your other uh, YouTube uh, videos. Uh, are they on, uh, on under Dr. Legume as well? Yes. Yeah. So if you type Dr. Legume in, on YouTube, you can uh, see all the other videos and uh, Worms, uh, Hard Work and Venus, they were really fascinating subjects and everything else that you showed us actually. I just wanted to say that if you would like to see the artworks uh, of Pierre and other artists uh, uh, on our uh, platform, visit uh, wma.museum. And that's a virtual museum Anthropocene, a virtual museum of Anthropocene. Uh, and the next artist talk will happen on Wednesday uh, at seven. And so please tune in. And thank you, Pierre, once again uh, for talking to us and for bringing your artwork and the smile to our faces and more uh, emotions to our hearts. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very so much. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.